All right, guys, you need to know that we are recording right now. This is the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv. I am Glenn Lowry, Professor of Economics and of International and Public Affairs at Brown University. And I am with this morning, Stephen Tellis, Professor of Politics at Johns Hopkins University and Harold Pollock, Professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. Um, and we're doing policy analysis talk this morning in the midst of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We are friends, I've known each other uh, for a long time, and we are all friends of, uh, we're all friends of the great Mark Kleiman, the policy uh, uh, analysis virtuoso whom we miss and who has been eulogized here at the Glenn Show. Um, and we're here to talk amongst ourselves, uh, for your benefit, we hope, um, about the intellectual challenges which are uh, put before us by the um, COVID-19 pandemic and about the extent to which the field of public policy analysis can make a substantive contribution to the society's management of this uh, crisis. So uh, welcome, Steve, and welcome, Harold. Thanks for having us, Glenn. Thanks for having here. And I should also mention I'm also a senior fellow at the Eunice Gannon Center. Oh, we wouldn't want to overlook that. No, we wouldn't want to overlook that. OK, so. Um, Everybody knows what the issues are on the table here in front of us in terms of managing this, uh, this crisis situation, economic shutdown, uh, public health uh, catastrophe, uh, people are dying left and right, what do we do, what do we do? And uh, there are various fields of expertise that are factoring into the public debate about this, uh, medical and public health expertise to be sure, um, economic expertise in terms of managing the fallout for the economy, uh, supply chain logistics and all of that. Uh, what about public policy analysis? We uh, sit here, um, uh, each of us having had a, a relatively long careers in a, 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 the academy uh, where we teach our students and we, you know, we go through cases and we analyze problems and we write papers and books. Uh, I'm uh, interested in you guys' uh, thoughts about uh, how the field of public policy analysis can make a distinct contribution here. Uh, and as I say, we do this with a vivid memory of uh, the great Mark Kleiman, um, public policy analysis analyst extraordinaire, um, and uh, often have been asking ourselves, I think all three of us, what might Mark have to say about the situation today? What do we have to say in his memory and in the spirit of uh, being experts on public policy analysis? Yeah, I wanted to actually start just a little bit about, um, I think, especially for your, uh, your listeners and viewers to think about, you know, where, where did public policy analysis as a way of thinking come from? Um, one way to think about this is to think about the history of the Kennedy School, which was obviously very important, um, you know, for both of y'all and for, uh, for Mark. Um, you know, in the, it partially came out of, of trying to create an institution in the memory of John F. Kennedy, um, and it brought together a bunch of people, a lot of whom had been at the Rand Corporation, who had some experience uh, with that. But more broadly, I think it came out of a sense in the 1960s that um, we were, America was becoming a modern state, right? We were um, having to sort of manage uh, all these enormously complex problems, and the analytical capacity of government to make sense of it, simply to deal with the teeming complexity of all these problems that the government was taking on, were just overwhelming the capacity of the state to manage. And we had lots of evidence of that in the 1960s, right? You know, um, you know, anytime you picked up the paper in the 1960s, you would have gotten an article about somebody had an idea for a program and it didn't work out the way people thought it would. Um, and I think that really had an effect and these were not mainly conservatives. These were people who were believers in that project of the modern state, um, but realized it was beyond their ability to make sense of. And the Kennedy School brought together originally a lot of these people who are practitioners of these various different disciplines. And Mark was trained at the, the Kennedy School by a number of those, uh, Howard, Howard Reifa, Thomas Schelling in particular, uh, who was very close, uh, Dick Zeckhauser, all of these people were trying to come up with a way to make sense um, of how do we understand these complicated multi-dimensional problems. And the other thing I'd say just about Mark is Mark brought to that um, educational experience a really unusual combination of things he'd actually done in his life, right? Unlike a lot of people in the academy, 
who, you know, go to a great undergraduate school, then they go to grad school in economics, they do spend four years, they learn a lot of complex techniques, then they come out and they graduate, they get a tenure track job, right? Mark took a much more indirect way. He worked for a major company in the Polaroid company. He worked for the government, the Department of Justice. He worked for the city of Boston. And I think as a consequence, right, he developed um, what a friend of mine used to call a dirty mind, an ability to see problems not as clean, but as having all kinds of dirty elements that the analyst sitting in his office couldn't necessarily understand. And so when Mark was thinking about policy analysis, it really was pulling together all of these complex analytical techniques that were being developed at places like the Kennedy School, but then run through this actual rich set of experiences that I think are increasingly uncommon for people in the modern academy doing policy analysis. What do you think, Harold? I think it's a nice tribute to Mark and the way that, and one of the things that I liked about Mark was that he could draw from so many different intellectual communities, but he wasn't completely enmeshed in any one of them. And, you know, if you wanted to know, uh, you know, how do I, how do I solve this complex, uh, uh, problem in economic theory that involves, uh, you know, a deep understanding of uh, advanced mathematical techniques. Uh, you know, uh, Glenn Lowry would certainly be, uh, I'd go to Glenn before I'd go to Mark with, uh, with a theoretical insight. If you wanted something that was part of some, the idea that was that, that no particular community identified with, but that was actually really important, Mark was and I think this is where you see Schelling and Zeckhauser, people like that, who, who sort of had that kind of imagination that I really, uh, uh, you know, that I really admire. I mean, I was thinking uh, as as Steve was laying out the history of the Kennedy School, I think one of the things that I was thinking about is the craft of public policy. And, you know, we're, we're witnessing a failure of public policy of tremendous dimension right now with this pandemic and you know it's it's bigger than any one person it's really uh there's a whole series of failures that that have occurred that have created the tragedy that we're now uh witnessing and you know public policy we often think of it excuse as excuse me for interrupting harold but yeah. would you mind just enumerating a little bit what those failures are well there was the, the, a failure of detection and early action, a failure, you know, we're spending $3.6 trillion a year on personal medical services in the United States every year, and we don't have enough N95 masks and ventilators and, you know, person, you know, PPE, uh, things that we, we don't have a public health infrastructure that is of a scale that allows us to do the massive testing and epidemiological surveillance that we need to be doing right now. We're trying to create in the midst of a pandemic, a set of capacities that, that we should have been creating over decades for this moment. And okay. uh, that is a very sobering failure. Uh, and it's one, you know, public people, we often think of policy analysis as we have a decision tree. We have to figure out how to make a decision right now that we have to make the right decision given a set of discrete alternatives. And that's, that's part of it. But the real craft is to, of public policy is how do we create organizational capacities, channels of focused expertise and accountability and organizational procedures that are regularized so that when a threat emerges, we have a capacity to deal with it in a regular way. Uh, it is, it is, you know, COVID-19 was not foreseeable in its particular, you know, its particularity, but the idea that we would have a, a, an infectious agent that emerged in a globalized world and that it would create some of the challenges that we have, that was, that was not only predictable, but in fact, it was predicted and people talked about it. There were, you know, there were various wargaming efforts that did not lead to effective capacity and, and I think Mark is the kind of person who would, who is very good at thinking about not just what do we need to do, but how will we need to do that, and and do that well. And and um, you know when I, I used to talk to him about drug enforcement, and he was very concerned about violence in Mexico, and he said, you know, we have this whole apparatus of the DEA, and they're really focused on stopping drug selling organizations that bring in the most drugs into the United States. Why don't they be? Fo why aren't they focused on the organizations that create the most dead bodies? 
and and convince these organizations that it's a bad business model to be shooting people in Mexico. You know, these same organizations, they don't shoot people in the United States. They know that 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 that's a very bad business practice to do. You know, there's actually surprisingly little violence in the United States from some of the same organizations that in Mexico are committing huge numbers of murders. And and he was he was able to take that step back and say, you know, we have this organization that's kind of evolved around a core mission and a set of things that it's doing. And is it is it really focusing on the right things? So uh, uh, so I must say I, I do uh, I'm wondering in this moment what kind of imaginative ideas Mark would have to say you know we have the CDC we have the WHO we have all we have these academic medical centers all over the United States and medical schools how do they conceive of their mission and how do they need to conceive of their mission differently with you know with the thought of protecting us all against a pandemic. Uh, yeah, you know, one thing yeah. I wanted to say on that, just to go back to thinking about this, uh, you know, about Mark and what, you know, policy analysis at its highest level uh, mm -hmm. really is. One thing I think that really distinguishes Mark from, uh, I think, certainly a lot of economists, um, mm -hmm. but a lot of social scientists in general, is Mark had an enormous appreciation for the people who actually do the work of governance. Um, he had a real, you know, A, he had actually, you know, was in contact with those people on a regular basis. He had a sense of what um, people doing implementation at a really high level was and what an art that was. And I don't yeah. think he thought of himself as superior to those people because he had a particular set of abstract um, uh, analytical tools that he could bring to the problem. Right? He thought about that as an equal kind of um, art or skill, yep. and I think yep. that's very important. The other thing, just to back off what you were saying mm -hmm. about the nature of our response, and just because this is my bailiwick, I want to throw this in. When you think about that enterprise of the Kennedy School, right, um, of creating a set of analytical tools to guide um, policy, the people who did that thought that we were simultaneously creating a modern state that would be able to slot those people in, right, into decision, right? They, they really thought about this, and I, I've yeah. actually seen some of the original proposals from the Kennedy School, which are in the Ford Foundation archive, oh, wow. and they, they really thought that they were creating, that the Kennedy School was part of building the modern state, right, that you were going to be building people in who were going to be doing um, this kind of analysis as a regularized part of state functioning, right? They were moving from a kind of what um, Steve Skoranek called the state of courts and parties to a much more bureaucratic state. And I think one thing you see in COVID-19 is that um, while I think Harold's right, that we have all these different pieces of expertise here, there, and everywhere, what we don't really have is a kind of coordinating structure that can make them work together. And that is, a, I think, a feature of the American state that's particularly problematic in times like this, that figuring out how to take all those capacities, which are often quite impressive, and actually direct them to the achievement of a particular goal is a real breakdown in the American state structure. Uh, I think there's also, you know, Mark was also a political theorist, uh, you know, he's very interested in John Rawls and in and, and, uh, political philosophy. And one of the striking things is that in the American political tradition, the administrative state has been problematic in its democratic legitimacy and in a way that uh, that, that needs to be uh, uh, you know that needs to be reevaluated. It, it seems to me there's a sense in which someone like say Tony Fauci actually has tremendous democratic legitimacy. He is as not not he as an individual, but he as the as the person who is operating over a long period of time a set of critical functions that that over decades we have built up carefully that that, that holds a lot of expertise uh, and that is expected in a pandemic to do certain things there's a, there's a very strange way that that when he's on the, when he's up there with the president of the United States he actually has a kind of authority that even the president doesn't have because the president's an elected official and and can choose who is in Tony Fauci's position, but the position that Tony Fauci has, the president has an obligation to 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 be the steward of that capacity. Yeah, and to, right. and, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah, just one point. I, I just want to make oh, hold one on, Steve. To, okay, go ahead, go ahead. No, if you if you're finishing up here, because I want to I want to kind of push back yeah. against the hagiography on Mark Kleiman. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah, well, I'm so I, I actually want to give one more piece of hay geography a little bit, but it's also just that's what I thought in advance. I'm preemptively <laughs> sucking up yeah. right now. Um, it, one thing I think again that just to go back to Mark, um, Mark had actually wrangled with a lot of those public health experts that um, Harold is talking about, right? Yeah. And again, I think this is one really important thing to keep in mind. That's really hard to keep straight, um, which is it's one thing to think that it's really important to build up expert analytical and administrative capacity in the modern state. It's another thing to think that we should defer to that capacity or expertise, right? Um, but, and I think you've seen a lot of this around the response to COVID-19 where the kind of appropriate thing for people who are like us to say is, oh, we should, you know, trust experts, right? You've actually seen these like PSAs where they say, what we need to do in COVID-19 is all trust experts. Um, but, you know, the job of political leadership is to recognize that experts disagree, right? Especially when you think about what is, what is policy analysis. Policy analysis is trying to integrate the insights of a whole bunch of different disciplines whose specialization by definition means they don't all come to the same agreement, right? And that's what um, policy analysis at its highest level also means pushing back and looking at what are the embedded normative assumptions in different forms of expertise. And Mark, again, in, on drug policy, had very much wrangled with people who brought a particular form of expertise mm -hmm. to that. And he didn't defer to what those people thought because he had another form of knowledge that told them that what they were saying was at least incomplete. And I think that's one of the things in a crisis like this you need is leadership who can both learn from, but also integrate and push back against what experts, what experts are saying. That's uh, in the spirit of what uh, I wanted to uh, offer here, but uh, let me just proceed a little bit more systematically. Mm -hmm. um, Mark uh, had a consultancy, a private uh, company that he ran called Botec, B-O-T-E-C, Back of the Envelope Calculation. It's an acronym. And uh, it's also a problem because there's not enough room on the back of the envelope. Not, there's not enough room either for the model or for welfare economics. I'm what I'm going to call welfare economics, mm -hmm. which I think is a little bit in the direction of what you were just alluding to. Let me elaborate. The model has to be very complicated. It's technical. Uh, it involves uh, the application of scientific theory in the case at hand about the socio-epidemiological dynamics of viral uh, infectious diseases. Um, it involves assumptions, it involves data, it involves statistical inference. None of these things are things that a back of the envelope calculator is adept at. And yet a lot hangs on the model. Uh, so the uh, depth of uh, analytical sophistication required in order to be able to elaborate a credible and relatively accurate model of what uh, the complex world that we're actually embedded in is above the pay grade, the intellectual pay, pay, pay grade of policy analysis I maintain. The other point that I wanted to make is evaluation of outcomes. How do we actually make the decision about the relative weight to place upon different and sometimes incommensurate values? That is also not something that policy analysis does very well. I can remember once hearing Thomas Schelling, the great, the late great Thomas Schelling, uh, dress down Robert Reich. This is at the Kennedy School back in the 1980s. Reich had given a talk basically saying, we should build the bridge over to the island because when we do, it'll be a new world and islanders and mainlanders will come into contact with each other and they will create a social dynamic that we can't even imagine right now. Let's build that bridge. Never mind how much people are willing to pay for the bridge, let's build the bridge. To which Schelling said, that's a step on the slippery slope to fascism. Not those words, but that was the point. Because who are you sitting in your office speculating about what kind of brave new world will we have when the bridge from the mainland to the island has been constructed to override the express willingnesses to pay of people who will or will not pay a toll to get on that bridge and go over to the island. You envision a world not of our actual uh, experience, but a world of your imagination. Um, what I'm trying to get at here is if we indeed, let's take the question of whether or not and when and how to open up the economy and the trade-off between lives lost in one way or another on the one hand and economic valuations on the other. 
where is policy analysis going to give me any kind of uh, toehold for being able to assess that situation? And uh, isn't its invocation a backhanded way of having experts, as you were just alluding to, substitute their judgment about matters on which their expertise is not especially um, uh, definitive uh, for the uh, expressed judgments of quote unquote the people as uh, as indicated by their uh, by their political choice as a leadership. Let me, let me say a few things about that, if I may. Uh, one is- hey, Was that clear? I just want to- Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, I, by the way, I'm reminded, as I've mentioned, I think in a previous uh, conversation we had that, that uh, uh, yeah, the idea that, uh, uh, that I, I think maybe it was Winston Churchill who said, uh, you know, the brain should be on tap, but not on top. And the purpose of the, if you say, what's the contribution of the back of the envelope thinker? I think it's it's a couple of things. You mentioned you mentioned that one the, the lack of full analytic sophistication to play out, you know the the, the scientific you know the the detailed granular scientific analysis uh, and right. evaluation. Uh, there's also the there's also this the institutional sophistication to understand how to implement uh, a you know there's a lot of common sense ideas that look great on the back of the envelope. But you have to you have to wed those to institutional capacity. I think Mark was actually very respectful. I could see him going into a local health department, and whatever he thought about the ideological blinders of the public health community, he would be really interested in how they went out and found somebody at risk of HIV, and how do you talk to that person, and tell me about what you do. And I'm, I'm going to respect that uh, in uh, your expertise as an implementor. But I, I think that the back of the envelope guy can prod the people with the substance of expertise and can say, hey, uh, here's some ideas uh, that, uh, that I, want you to, I want you to go and see if they're, if they're realistic within the world that you're living in. And you can also spot some of the blinders that these, uh, you, know, the, you know, that the public health community or others can go under. If you do a back of the envelope calculation for some intervention that people are really enthusiastic about and you say, you know, the cost per life saved here is is thirty two million dollars? Is that really? Yeah, I just did the long. You know, Richard Zakhaus like to say the the greatest tool of policy analysis is long division. And sometimes you do something. You say, you know, are we going into overkill on this policy? And are there other opportunities that we might have to save more people than than making this than making the water, uh, you know, super clean instead of clean? Uh, in you know, in your you know, within your within your domain of responsibility and you know, there are times when that can be a very valuable exercise. You know, we've, we've driven the crime rate down and we're causing a lot of problems in the community. Let's think about, you know, what is, what is the, the cost per crime prevented of your really aggressive policing strategy, even if we acknowledge that it's reducing crime. Uh, and uh, the other thing that, that Mark was imaginative about is, I, I'm thinking, just jumping back to the COVID thing, I'm thinking about some conversations that I've had with my friend John Calkins, who you guys may uh, may know, uh, that uh, he said, you know, we're in this period of lockdown right now, and we and it's a question of how long we should be in this period of lockdown to yeah. slow the virus. The public health community, to a great extent, is thinking about this as a problem of how long do we need to stay locked down so that epidemiologically, you know, we're we're creating protection. And and we're we're um, and that's incredibly important. Are we using this time effectively to harden the parts of the economy that we're going to need to open fairly soon, because they're so vital for the society? Are we looking for opportunities to say, you know, people are still buying gas? You know, one of the examples that John had was maybe we should hire people to stand there at the gas pump who are properly protected, who are pumping gas for people, get some income to people, protect us all from grabbing the gas pump. Uh, you know, when by potentially getting infected because we're sort of, you know, grabbing this handle of this thing. And um, uh, how do we use this time uh, in a smart way uh, and not just debate how long do we stay shut down, but how are we using this time? Because, uh, you know, time is precious. And, yeah, and, so, uh, yeah, go yeah. Ahead. yeah, so a couple of things I would actually add to that. Um, one, I think the most, you know, probably the most important skill that public policy analysis, as I understand it, has to add to the deliberation of the people who are actually authorized to make decisions. And I think that's the, 
important point, right? You know, democratically, we do embed the ability to make these decisions in people who are chosen largely through democratic, but sometimes through bureaucratic mechanisms, right, or through mechanisms of law. Um, the most important thing that they can bring to that is to ask, and then what? Right. And that's the thing that often policymakers don't go all the way down the tree on. Right. OK, you do that. And then what's the effect of that going to be? Now, again, some of those are, in fact, back of the envelope calculations. Right. That is, we're take, making guesses about if we do that. Well, what else happens, especially in a complex system where lots of those reactions are reactions to other people's reactions. Right. And you have to have some kind of model of, of that. Right. Um, but in particular, I think here in the context of COVID-19 about the fact that, you know, lots of these measures depend upon some form of at least roughly voluntary compliance, right? People have to do it without um, us applying uh, the course of apparatus of the state, or at least in a very precise way, right? And then one thing that Mark um, really knew, and this goes back to his teacher, um, Tom Schelling, right, he, right at the beginning of his, his Mark's great book, um, When Brute Force Fails, he has the great quote from Tom Schelling from Arms and Influence, where he says, effective deterrent uh, threats are never carried out, right? Um, so part of, you know, this art is how do we economize on our coercive authority, right? And in some sense, how do we economize on all of the tools of um, that the state is applying to a problem. I think Mark was extraordinarily sensitive to that, in part, I think, also because Mark was a liberal. Uh, and I mean liberal, small l, classical liberal. Um, he'd been a student of Judith Schlar, um, actually as well as Harvey Mansfield, which is an interesting fact. Um, but just to go to this, right, he, Mark was very sensitive to cruelty. In fact, I've never met anybody who I think was more personally offended by cruelty. And yet he was working in a field that was really about the practical application of cruelty to solve public policy problems. Um, so I would say that that, you know, is something that he would be thinking very much about this, that because he hated, he really didn't like coercion and didn't like cruelty, he was thinking about how to economize on it. And soon this will become a dimension of this problem. And this is one thing, the last thing I'll say on this. Um, I doubt we're going to get the level of response that we are currently talking about needing from a testing or other kind of regime through a purely voluntary regime. And I think one thing that is problematic about the kind of world that public health people come from is they often hide the coercive hand of the state. Um, they often like to think about um, uh, the fact that these things are going to be done without, you know, somebody actually grabbing somebody by the scruff of the neck and making somebody do that, and how do we authorize that? And Mark really faced that fact, um, I think, in his work and really thought about it. Um, okay, and so Steve. I, yep, so that's, that's, I think, one of the dimensions I think is applicable to this problem. Let me get you guys to react to this. Um, I think it was Brookings that just came out with a study estimating the cost to the economy of the shutdown is running at roughly uh, $50 billion a day. Mm -hmm. Let's take that as a benchmark. Let's suppose we're shut down for 200 days. Uh, 200 times 50 billion, I think, comes to 10 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, let's suppose there's 100,000 lives saved by the shutdown. I'm just making these numbers up. 100,000 into uh, 10 trillion comes to $100 million a life. That's too much. That's way too much. So I'm just asking you to respond to this. I hope my arithmetic is right. I did it in my head. I, uh, I'm at, so here's what I'm trying to get you to respond. That's way too much by any rational decision-making calculus. I'm not talking about the theory of ethics of what is a life and so forth. And so I'm saying nobody spends $100 million to save a life anywhere where practical decisions are being made. We could make our roads safer, et cetera. We could not mine coal in uncertain conditions, et cetera. And, and, and we do it, and implicitly, we're spending a good deal less than $100 million to save a life in all the practical arenas where we're making those decisions. And yet, here we are. This is a reflection, not of rational decision-making of the sort that we would want to lionize in the spirit of uh, policy uh, mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. This is a result of panic, of a social um, uh, uh, circumstance, an equilibrium political interaction in which 
No one can say what I just said without uh, being uh, pilloried on Twitter and elsewhere as being inhumane. Everybody has to give a speech that says, in effect, life is of infinite value. We must do this in order to save lives. And in fact, it's not a random uh, hit of lives lost or saved here. The cost of the shutdown are borne especially heavily by some of the most vulnerable people in our society. So I would even want to amplify the point that we're spending way too much in terms of economic cost in order to generate the benefit. Well, let me uh, and yet we can't, and we, yet we can't say so. And that's a breakdown of the structure of political discourse uh, to which a, a sophisticated policy analytic uh, approach ought to pay considerable attention. By the way, I've, I've been in so, react to that. Let me, by the way, I've been in many conversations where people say exactly what you just said, and then say, "We we can't say this," and I'm like, "Well, you just said it." Like, you know, I, but uh, well, the no, best I, night, well, hold Andrew on, me, Cuomo can't say it. Well, let me let me say this. There's a couple of things. First of, all, first of all, the best the best macroeconomic analysis that I have seen suggested that at a cost of about two trillion dollars to the economy, something like that. Uh, that the expected saving in lives is 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 on the order of six hundred thousand, compared to where well, they compared a sort of do nothing response to a, a fairly aggressive response. I'm sure there's lots of ways that that analysis would need to be refined, uh, and 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 actually, if you compare that, if you use uh, you know standard valuations of the value of a statistical life, it is below the top threshold, which the, the U.S. government uses nine point six million dollars per life save is kind of the this, the benchmark that the Trump administration uses and the Obama administration and so on used for environmental regulation is below it, but it's not super below it. And it is a legitimate question to say there is, I agree with you, there is a trade-off. I would say there's two things about that. Uh, one is how we, how we protect ourselves epidemiologically is critically important, both in terms of how do we buffer vulnerable populations uh, you know, through social insurance and other mechanisms, that's critical. Uh, and uh, and also that we that we that we conceive of this as a more granular than a binary choice. There are things, there are parts of the economy that we can re-engage uh, safely, and there are parts that we can. There are parts that we have to re-engage because you need a supply chain for food and for medicine and for healthcare uh, th that you know that we that we can't shut down. And uh, so one of the things that we have to think about is what does a what does a sustainable shutdown look like that protects us epidemiologically, but that is also economically and logistically feasible? And it's not, it's not quite as binary as we're going to go 200 days with no economic activity. It's really, uh, you know, the, the a calculation that I offered didn't presume no economic activity. Right. It presumed a broad shutdown, which significantly reduced $50 billion a day right. is considerably less than the GDP flow in the United States. So, no one's assuming no economic activity, but I, I made the numbers up. So, you know. Right. Well, the, the part that you made up really, by the way, was, oh, sorry, was go ahead. 10 million. Yeah, I think the answer answer was 10 million and not 100 million for live safe and the calculation you did. But I, I may okay. be wrong because I'm not a mathematician and you sort of are. So, um, no, the calculation is definitely that wrong. Would... That's uh, just, just FYI. But, uh, yeah, but so... the point is, I, we see the general point. The actual calculation is slightly off. But, right, but I, I want to take Glenn's point seriously um, yeah, for a second. You. Um, which is one, right? And again, as, as Mark would say, right, this shutdown is a brute force tool, right? Um, this is, you know, and again, you know, and it, as a consequence of that, it does involve an enormous, right, um, loss to the economy uh, by making basically immediately saying everyone's just got to stay home. And of course, they're not. And that's a, that raises the question. I do think there's a question about given the actual capacity of the American state to get compliance with these orders. Mm -hmm. um, are we really getting a benefit of a lockdown? Or are we just getting all of the costs? And that's a that's mm -hmm. an open question. But I think, or are we merely delaying the consequences until the inevitable date arrives when the lockdown has to be relaxed, right. but the virus has not been extirpated? Right. Although I, I look, I do think that one thing we are seeing is a lot. We're not going to get a vaccine for a very long time, right? I think we're. Not, we, I've seen estimates that we may not get a vaccine for over two years. Um, but we're getting a lot of treatments. And so actually pushing forward that uh, contraction of the disease to when we actually have um, uh, treatments that can reduce the, the probability of loss of life is actually a very significant benefit. But just to go back to the point, right, there are lots of other countries that are not responding with lockdowns. 
Correct. And lots of those ones in East Asia are not responding with lockdowns, but then we have to ask why that is. And one of the reasons, now one is they caught it earlier and lockdown is a response once you've already got um, widespread population uh, contraction of the disease. But the other difference is, you know, those societies are simply constituted differently than we are. Take South Korea, which I think is the best example of that, right? South Korea is a country that is on permanent war footing, right? They are prepared as a society every day for the probability yeah. that North Korea is going to roll, roll over, right? And they, they're mobilized, right? That, this is a mobilized society. Got it. They're now, there are many countries in Europe that are also not locking down or are relaxing the lockdown. Denmark is sending their kids mm -hmm. back to school, even as we yeah. speak, for example. Yeah. Uh, there are very different ways of responding here. There's, I, I don't understand the uh, imperative uh, that follows from public health up to uh, the uh, single conclusion uh, that we have to stay, uh, that we have to stay. Uh, let me just get really briefly to just to that point, which is, you know, a lot of this depends on what you've got in your toolbox. And um, I do think, look, we sitting around could think about a much more um, fingers as opposed to thumbs kind of response to this <laughs> problem. But again, the actual state apparatus of the United States would have to be able to implement those things, right? They would actually be able to say, well, how do we coordinate who's going to work and who's not? You know, Warwick University has a plan that says we should put, you know, all the 20 and 30 year olds back to uh, work because they're probably, you know, the ones who don't live with, uh, with elderly people, mm -hmm. right? And there are good reasons to do that, the economic reasons in some sense mm -hmm. implied in some of Glenn's mm -hmm. argument, right? That, you know, we really worry about them losing labor force attachment. So that's very important and they're less likely to contract or die from the disease. But all of those things depend on um, whether or not you could actually do those things. So Glenn could sit in his office and imagine a world in which we had a much more fingers and not thumbs response. Um, but the reason, one of the reasons we have a lockdown is we have a kind of primitively organized state structure and ability to get voluntary co compliance and coordination that makes doing that alternative, which would be much less costly, very hard to imagine, actually. Let me push that point to its logical conclusion. Uh, some uh, civil disorder is waiting for us down the road if we persist in enforcing the lockdown on populations that are resistant to it. Not only can you not enforce it, you're likely to generate a backlash, and we're already beginning to see people gathering in state capitals protesting against governors who have said, you can open this, but you can't open that. And here I want to reiterate my point. If at the end of the day you cannot sustain this, don't you have to consider before you rely on this as the major tool for response to the circumstance, the consequences of possibly seeing it unravel before your eyes. You can be standing in the center in the state capitol in Washington, D.C., wagging your finger at people all you want. You can't force them to do it. Well, uh, when you say force them to do it, also, first of all, there's Partial compliance is very valuable, and there are things we can do that increase the compliance uh, and that make it more more sustainable for human beings. And, you know, here in Illinois, we are it is difficult, and we can't obviously can, we can't sustain this thing forever. But if you say, can we do this thing until June first uh, at a high level and get a lot of protection out of it, and how do we do that effectively? That becomes something that is. Believe me, if you were talking about opening up on June 1st, you wouldn't be hearing any pushback from me whatsoever. But we're talking about something that's going to be worse than that, aren't we? As we don't. Well, well it, I don't know. I think there's something between June 1st and 200 days that you talked about. And to me, the interesting question that we have to ask that goes with this is we don't exactly know how long we have to be shut down. Are we, are we doing everything we can to say, how do we make this work so that most, so that people uh, so that it's not devastating to people. And, uh, you know, my ability to, you know, if you said to me, I'm sitting in my basement, I'm drawing a paycheck, I'm able to do a lot of my job, probably the two of you. I didn't say that, but similar. it's true. And it's true of a lot of people who are waving and, the shutdown flag. And, well, so how many, what, how many truckers have you well, seen waving the shutdown flag? Well, let me, let me say that it depends. If you said to that trucker, okay, this is what we have to do. By the way, it may not be a complete shutdown because we need truckers. We need you to be delivering food to people. We need you to be doing stuff. We can pay you to do stuff that we need to be doing right now to help address this epidemic. To me, a lot of the challenge is to say, how do we 
understand the pain points that millions of Americans are experiencing because of this shutdown and say, A, can we, are you a person that we can somewhat relax the restrictions because epidemiologically is safe if we do this in the right way? Or B, we'll protect you. You know, you're going to be, you can't do your job the way you're doing it two months ago. So how do we keep you whole in that? And uh, you know, like there's a lot of people, you know, our, at the University of Chicago, one of the things that we've said to our hourly workers at our dining halls, who are contracted workers, actually, they don't work for the university, but they, you know, they're, they're, they're in our ecosystems. We've said, we're going to keep you whole for, a, uh, even though we, we don't want you working in the dining hall right now. And what we actually are going to have you do is deliver meals on the South side to needy people. And good, good for you. And right. there's a, that, that's, in, and I think by the way, that's just a, add to that Mark hagiography. I think he would, that's the kind of idea Mark would have liked. How do we repurpose what those people are doing so that we say, you need a salary, you need a job. We don't do want you, you allow, to be sitting do you in the dining hall. the possibility hall? that there's any um, identitarian or, or cultural dimension to how people respond to the shutdown mandate, that there isn't some element of wokeness, uh, believing in science, progressivity, I'm on the right side of history behind uh, those who advocate shutdown in some sense of, uh, I don't believe the hype, uh, I don't trust the experts, uh, I reject the uh, authority of institutions behind those who are not doing it. I mean, for example, uh, the rumor is that in many urban communities of African Americans, mm -hmm. there's skepticism about the imperative to follow the, the regime of mm -hmm. social distancing and hygiene in order to kill the flow of the virus. I don't know if that's true or false, but I've heard it said. If it were true, I would understand it because a lot of those people don't believe the hype. They think the cops are a dead set against them. They think this is a white man society, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of people in many corners of American society who are like that, not just people of color, not just racial minorities, who are like that in the sense that they don't identify with what's written in the New York Times or the Washington Post yeah. or what's said on CNN or what's said at the university campuses. Well, let me, let me just So, so are, are we just going to run roughshod over those people? Well, first yeah. of all, by the way, on the south side of Chicago, I mean, in Chicago, 70% of the people who died are African American. And one of the sad things is that COVID the costs of COVID are vivid in people's lives. I mean, the, the, uh, it, at, at the facility, at the developmental disability facility near our home, half of the residents are COVID positive and quite a few of the staff. And uh, all around us in the Southland of Chicago, people are getting sick. And okay, but that's not, a, I, I'm, I regret that, but that's not addressing my uh, No, point. but I mean, so the, the distrust, people don't have to trust anything that they're reading in the New York Times to know that they're facing an emergency because people close to them have died or are sick. And, right. and people are terrified that they are going to be next. So I'm going to see as many people wearing masks walking on the streets on the south side of Chicago as I see walking in uh, uh, the uh, Tony areas on the near north side of Chicago wearing masks. I don't know, but I think that it is, I think that there is a very vivid reality that people are seeing from COVID that is a much more powerful public health message than anything I'm going to say. Uh, right. and, yeah. Yeah, I ahead. want to actually take, I want to actually go where Glenn was trying to get us to go. Um, and I think Har Harold was trying to like tamp it down and I'm going to maybe not tamp it down so much, which is, you know, I do think one of the things when I, I, I teach a class, in fact, I'm teaching it now on policy disasters, which is, you know, large scale policy errors. And the mm -hmm. first book we have him read is James Scott Seeing Like a State. Um, and this is a very, you know, for good or ill, this is a very Jim Scott kind of intervention, right? It's based on abstract mm -hmm. knowledge developed at the center um, uh, based on, you know, epidemiology is the original form of state knowledge, right? The ability to sort of get a panoptical view of the entire society based on a thin form of information, right? Uh, and one thing, again, in all of Scott's work, including uh, Weapons of the Week and his other, uh, in his other writings, you know, he emphasizes that, um, you know, populations have lots of ways of not going along with um, schemes of central state uh, planning. Um, and, you know, we're already seeing it, right? I mean, then Glenn was referring to the fact, you know, Michigan, we have these protests where people are driving and, you know, um, the shocking thing to me is how little of that we've seen, right? 
Is there um, a, th th these are, you know, if I was trying to think about an intervention that was optimally designed to generate um, collective action in, uh, in, uh, to stop it, this would be pretty well designed, right? It's got very acute costs based on, um, at least up until now, and I think this is one, I think Harold's right, that at some point it may be that lived experience cuts across identity and signaling, right? And that's an interesting, I think, phenomenon that would be a good thing to model and write a paper on. Um, but, you know, I think in some ways, and again, I, I you know, I, I hate giving um, Trump his uh, due in part because I just wrote a book um, called Never Trump about, uh, about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But I actually think the fact that he is the president may be suppressing some of this collective action, right? Um, that you know, he goes possible. back and forth on whether or not we're closing and that's a problem, <laughs> right? But for the most part, he's more or less saying, you know, I'm supporting the shutdowns, right? I'm giving some identity cover for that. And I think that, you know, I mean, you can imagine if we had a Democratic president, if you had President Kamala Harris, right, say calling for a shutdown, I do think that a lot of that identity mix about how people are processing information, how people are um, understanding thread about whether or not they're trusting experts would sure. be very different. And that, you know, that's a little hard to say, but I do think if I'm taking Glenn's theory that people process information through identity yeah. seriously, yeah. so long as Trump is at least grudgingly going along with the shutdown, um, that he's probably carrying along and suppressing some of that collective action. I think that's actually that's a really right. good and interesting point. Yeah, that there's an identity vouching that's as as uh, as you've phrased it in other writings uh, in criminal justice reform, Steve. That that I think is is important, and uh, I think I think Kamala Harris would have been more likely to have responded effectively early on, but she also would have become a become based the on object. what based on what Harold? Powell? Oh, because she would be replacement level. Uh, at least. Right. I mean, I, I just think that, you know, there's no question that President Trump, you know, just did a poor job in the uh, in this in the early going. But I think that that uh, that she would also that she would have become a focus of a very polarizing politics that would be much more identitarian for the reasons that Steve just said. I think, you know, I mean, you, you, I, you know, if we had Mitt Romney as president, we might have oh, gotten oh, both. Well, this is this is a very interesting line of discussion because uh, it. Uh, pays uh, deference to the need to affirm uh, the legitimacy of the outcome of the 2016 election. No, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, you're, he's, you're, he's, you're he's, saying it's as public good, right? You're, you're, you're saying the authority of the president, the capacity of the president to be able to compel or not compel, but at least mm -hmm. engender a sense of, uh, of uh, acceptance from the uh, action of the state from his supporters is a social good. Sure, sure. There's no question, well, especially because he, especially point. because his core supporters are the people who are the most likely to have the most strong identitarian objections to a, to strong state action. And so there's no question that that he he would lend legitimacy to state action with people that feel a very strong affinity to him. That is, I think that's a very good insight. Uh, right. And I mean, you could go even further than that, right? I think a lot of the um, economic response, the um, fact that we're doing temporary universal mm -hmm. basic income, right? If we had an entirely democratic government yeah. now, that would have that would have all been read, reading very differently, right? I mean, people would matter. have seen it as a stalking horse for socialism, yeah. and they all they already are saying that, but they're not saying it nearly as often and as vociferously as if, as they would be saying it. If a, if a left of center government, can just make, by the way, it is a stalking horse for some aspects of a social democratic policy. I think we will after COVID is over. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, well, we'll the, see. Uh, yeah, but I, I would actually say, I mean, it does also matter just on this identity vouching. Um, so, with my second, my think tank hat at the Niskanen Center, we've been doing a lot of, we did a lot of work on those mm -hmm. bills. And among the people we were working with were Tom Cotton. Josh Hawley, Marco Rubio, right? They were the ones who, in many cases, were really pushing for immediate cash injections, which in themselves actually have lots of implementation uh, issues um, that we could have avoided if we'd been planning in advance, right? There were lots of proposals um, going back further, suggesting that we needed to have basically, you know, everybody have accounts at the Federal Reserve that you could immediately drop money into at a drop of a hat, and we didn't have that. But the point is, can I just mention here, excuse me, Josh Hawley was saying we, we, that we should do this, right, and not that it was all being pushed by Democrats. 
I just want people to know that Rajiv Seti, the economist at Columbia, and I had an extensive blogging heads conversation maybe two weeks ago about universal accounts at the Fed mm. uh, for people as a very good policy innovation that was Seti's position, uh, quite apart from the pandemic. And right. I, so I just want people to know that yeah, we've man, there was a question here. Right, and I should actually give a shout out to the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, along with the Hamilton Project at Brookings, had a thing, I think now a year or so ago, saying, you know, how do we respond to the next recession? And there was a whole chapter there basically saying we need to set up these and basically have automatic mechanisms, right? So the government doesn't have to do anything, right? Once the, you know, the unemployment rate changes a certain amount, then the accounts immediately happen, right? That would be, anyways, but the whole point is, I actually think some of the changes that are going on inside the Republican Party, right? Again, it's interesting that it's Cotton, Hawley, right, from the more populist side of the Republican Party. If we had that pure Tea Party Republican Party, you would you would have seen a lot more resistance, right? It's not a surprise that it's more coming from the national conservative type of, um, again, which I have a lot of problems with on some dimensions, but they've already had been rethinking Republican economics before this, and that allowed them to be open to this in a way they wouldn't if they'd been thinking purely through the sort of Tea Party libertarian kind of- Well, I, I, I think economics. one of the things that we've learned is that the sort of Tea Party libertarian small government ideology is not even what animates the Tea Party. And, and uh, you know, I mean, there's some people that are animated by that, but that, but that it's, that, that we could have a whole different uh, blogging head show. Theta Scotch Poll has been saying that for a long time, Theta yeah. Scotch Poll. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, I want to close yeah. us out yeah. and give you guys an opportunity. We've talked about Mark Kleiman, but he's not with us anymore, sadly. Who in the realm of policy analysis is saying sensible stuff about this problem that you guys would like for our audience to know about? Steve, why don't you go first? <laughs> I think you probably don't have an answer. I mean, again, I, I, I don't know anybody I think I, I has really gotten around. And some of this goes back to the point that Glenn said, right, which is, and again, this, you know, we, we've all, I get on this channel, have mentioned about 4,000 times his essay on political correctness. Um, but, you know, when people give advice or they express opinions, right, um, they're sending signals of identity, right, about who they are. And people are skeptical, especially right now. What kind of person are they? Right? And I'm worried, right, just to be honest, right, about raising some of my reservations or the elements of our current lockdown policy that I'm not entirely sure are going to work or going to uh, be effective. I have been a little hesitant about pushing how much I think a lot of the potential for widespread testing is actually not going to be uh, feasible or is going to face significant implementation problems or breakdowns. Uh, and so I do think part of this is about who's saying sensible things, but also whether or not we have a kind of constrained discourse, in part because we're worried about people continuing to do the thing we're doing, which may or may not be effective. And we're worried, I think, a little bit about expressing who we are when we're uh, making statements like that. So that's a, that's not a direct answer to Glenn's question, but it's an answer to another question Glenn might Well, have. it is a reference to my 1994 Rationality and Society classic, A Theory of Political Correctness. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, well, by the way, I'll, I'll mention a couple of people. Um, one is, I mean, I think the, the, the best macroeconomic analysis that I've seen is by Eichenbaum and colleagues, uh, which is an NBR working paper that uh, uh, that, that really does actually try to give a sense of the cost per life saved of some of the stringent uh, measures and incorporates epidemiological modeling. Uh, Paul Romer is another name that uh, someone who's, who's, I think, doing some really nice analytic work that combines economics and epidemiology in a nice way. Uh, Ed Kaplan and John Calkins uh, have been thinking in a very useful way about how we would restart the economy. Ed, Ed in an email referred to it as, how do we restart the economy in safe mode? You know, we have to reboot. And, and, and I think thinking about how to harden uh, uh, epidemiologically the parts of the economy that we want to open up as quickly as we can safely do, both in terms of the, the need for, the, for those, uh, you know, that, that output, but also so that we can put people back to work and make it less onerous for those truckers and others. Truck, how do we do trucking so that so the truckers are safer? is actually uh, in many ways a more interesting and intricate problem than when do we turn the switch and let the truckers go back to doing what they did. And so, so those would be some names that I would throw out. 
All right, that's uh, Stephen Tellis, Johns Hopkins University, Harold Pollock, the University of Chicago. Thanks for your wisdom. Forgive me for, uh, if I were overbearing at uh, points, it was only in the interest of keeping the conversation moving along. Thanks and forgive me, by the way, for challenging your long division, which was correct, although the, although the 200 days was wrong, but the long division <laughs> was correct. <laughs> wrong assumption, right arithmetic. Yes, yeah. classic okay. economic problem, yeah.